wow, my, my phones are really bad today. Uh, just to kind of name some kind of, you know, clouds of thought that I'm starting to see between um, the two of them. And I think, Charlie, you might kind of play this to yours as well. So, I'm, you know, I'm kind, of think, I'm kind of seeing, you know, tentativeness. And that's kind of the nature of, like, is it a test? Is it not a test? Right? Like, this, this kind of, like, this kind of impetus to hypothesize, to negotiate, to ask for advice, to, you know, to let this test thing. Right? Um, but also at the same time, you know, this, this concept of what is a game. It's a different, different ontologies and different ways of thinking about what negotiations are. Are they games? Are they ceremonies? Are they, you know, people's livelihoods? Um, are they people's modes of living and mobility? Um, so some things to kind of grapple with. But we'll switch disciplines um, and we'll go to frack trees. Cool. Awesome. Take it away. All right, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. And everyone, uh, yeah, big round of uh, applause for Michael. Uh, uh, literally props. About props, yeah. Thank you for acknowledging the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and the Mississauga First Nations of the Port Credit River Valley. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge that we are here in Toronto on traditional First Nations lands. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk today about. Um, Sort of geometry in nature and uh, how it occurs, why it occurs, why it's useful, why should, we should know about it, and uh, how we can use it to our own benefit. Okay, so here's an image. It's uh, it's of trees, and we're all very familiar with trees. There's trees in the quad. There's trees outside. We walk by them every day, but we never. Well, it's maybe rare to think about the geometry that they take because it doesn't fall into our traditional categories. Sorry. And uh, and so. Fractals are this really interesting way of categorizing shapes that are more natural, like trees and clouds. And so what is a fractal? I'm just trying to take this out, yeah. So fractals are structures that when uh, you zoom into them, you see a similar shape that you saw when you were looking at the whole. So for example, if we look very closely at a, at a zoomed in, uh, section of this cluster of trees, we end up seeing something that looks very much like the zoomed out version. And this is a common geometry in nature. It, uh, it occurs when we have the ability to kind of reproduce the same shapes across some range of scales. And mathematically, we can think about this uh, in a very kind of um, simple algorithm. Basically, we start with some kind of Y. And on the tip of each Y, we add Ys. And we repeat that process. And in mathematics, you might repeat that infinitely. But in nature, we never see it complete in that sense. It's usually three, four, five, six kinds of types of, in, uh, three, four, or five iterations. Uh, and it's amazing how quickly we end up with complication or complexity when we started with something simple and the rules to generate these kinds of things are very simple. And there are other kinds of fractals that we might be curious about. This is the Koch curve. Basically, we start with a straight line. We take the middle third, we put a triangle on it, and we delete what we were starting with. And then we repeat that process, and we repeat it again. And we get a, a shape that, if carried on infinitely, has an infinite length, despite the fact that it fits in a very well-defined and prescribed volume. You can see that the length of this line has increased at each iteration. So if we were to repeat that infinitely, we get an infinitely long line. It's very squiggly. <laughs> but it doesn't just happen in math. It happens in the food we eat. So this is Romanesco broccoli. And we can see here that we have a very large cone, if you squint. And on that cone, we have smaller cones. And they kind of spiral their way to the top. But each one of those cones has cones on it as well, and those cones have cones on them as well. And that iteration might happen four, five, six times within this regime of conical symmetry, spiraled cones. Beyond that, we get into something, a whole different regime of structure, cellular maybe. But at least for a certain range, we can see a very well-ordered repeated pattern in nature. And we, will, we look at cauliflower, sorry to bore you with vegetables. <laughs> but the same kind of thing is happening. We have this pillowy shape. And on top of it, there are smaller pillowy shapes. And on top of those, there are smaller pillowy shapes. And we can repeat this ad infinitum. 
maybe four, five, six times for cauliflower. <laughs> Oddly, inside cauliflower, the root of that pillowy shape is a branch structure. And that's weird. Because <laughs> I never would have looked at cauliflower from the outside, but branching, no. But when you cut it in half, you can see it. So here are a few more pillowy examples that are very familiar, but have, you know, maybe strange commonalities. So a tree and a cloud, very different things, of course. One is just water vapor rising by drawing through uh, heat from sunlight. The other is carbon structure. It's much more complicated than that. I don't even know what the chemistry of a tree is. I mean, it's largely hydrocarbon, but it basically has kind of created an infrastructure for doing the same thing, which is evaporating water from the ground to the sky. And the water is taking similar looking pathways if you squint. And both of these things, despite the fact that they're completely different scales, sizes, in both space and time, I mean, a tree life might be 300 years, especially that one. This might have only lived for a few hours or less, a few minutes. But they somehow find similar structures to do something that's pretty ordinary, but also kind of miraculous. Finding ways of transporting energy across a gradient, a hot earth to a cooler sky. And this is the kind of structure that we find when we look at systems that dissipate energy. So dissipation, what is it? Well, we may be familiar with it from high school textbooks or from simple kitchen countertop experiments. You put a hot, hot, no, you put a pot of water on a hot stove and convective cycles start to form inside the pot. And the pot is designed to kind of mix the water, but well, maybe it's not. But in any case, uh, convective cycles emerge. And this process can actually be exacerbated in very thin liquid sheets. So instead of having a deep pot, we have a very thin liquid sheet. And what's going to happen is as we heat it from below, we get, oh, you can't see that. <laughs> Let's see if that don't load fast enough. This is my only YouTube video, I'm really sorry about that. Okay. As we heated this liquid from below, these globules start to kind of float to the surface. This is a thin, thin layer of liquid on a hot surface, looking at it from above. And instead of having just one big convective cell, small convective cells start to arrange themselves. This fluid is undergoing a kind of metamorphosis of finding a shape that does something effectively. And what it's doing is it's transporting heat from below to above. And this is just the way that it does it. And so it will tile this entire fluid volume with hex hexagonal convecting cells. In the center of the cell, you can just see fluid is rising. And at the boundaries, it's sinking. So what's happening here? <clears throat> well, one thing I didn't tell you was that if you heat the plate very quickly, or if you make it very hot, the fluid boils. And if you heat it in not so hot, in a kind of cool way, uh, it just swirls. Nothing really interesting happens. But in a middle ground, you get emergence of complexity and of structure, geometry. And that's true of our solar system, too, by, by coincidence. Maybe just by coincidence, but maybe not. If you're too close to the sun, the atmosphere and the water vaporize. If you're too far away, they freeze. But if you're in some middle ground, the Goldilocks zone, 
as astronomers like to call it, then you get some kind of liquid water phase where life is possible. And even within our own bodies, we have structures that dissipate energy or that transfer chemistry and fluids in a very efficient way. So our, our body's vasculature is incredibly good at that. You are composed of mostly not blood. I mean, four or five uh, liters of blood in your body, and that blood is able to uh, bring oxygen and remove waste from every single cell inside your body. It's incredibly efficient at reaching those places. Your lungs have the internal surface area of one half of a tennis court, all wrapped up inside your chest. And that's the result of having these tubes that branch to finer and finer scales, where the area can be accessed. <clears throat> and when we do computer simulations, and this is not a low-resolution picture, it's a low-resolution simulation because these things are expensive, computationally, where we have a, a heated plate that has one port where it can shed heat from, well, it drains in this kind of branched way, because branches are really good ways of accessing space. And while this shape was optimized to transport heat, it ends up having good structural properties, as the lily pad demonstrates. Not only is it conducting fluids to this lily pad, but it's also providing architecture. And I think somewhere in here, we're creeping into the realm of evolution and asking questions about how these shapes emerged in biology. So as a you know, brief uh, reminder of what evolution is, you have some, some seed. And it, through asexual or sexual reproduction, creates variants. And those variants are numerous, but not all of them will survive, as this grasshopper parenting cartoon illustrates. <laughs> Some will, and they will go on to create variants of their own, and so on and so forth. This tree-like structure will have some branches that continue on through time, and others that uh, end early. And that's true of lots of different kinds of branching structures. So we have some source of growing branches, okay, and maybe there's some you know, goal, but there doesn't have to be. Maybe it's a nugget of food or something. As this thing grows, these tips are competing to fill volume, to fill space. Maybe in this page there's a pressure gradient, or there's a thermal gradient, or there's an electromagnetic gradient, or there's a chemical gradient, or there's something that's driving the growth of these branches. And they compete, and one of them might make it there, but you can see that during the growth process, some of them got cut off by others as others filled the space. And this is a good model of the most basic form of evolution as described by Darwin. There is, um, there is a kind of mother or origin, and there is descent with modification. There's variation. There, uh, the arrow that represents the parent is then modified in, uh, in its offspring. And these channels are seeking something. They're growing. And we can see this in uh, all kinds of natural examples, but I really like the spruce tree because it gives this trifurcation, this trident at its, as it, at its bud tips. And we can see that the middle one is mostly not varied very much from the direction or location of its parent, but the two lateral ones have varied somewhat, and they will explore different spaces and they will try to find sunlight and absorb it to create energy and build themselves and grow and replicate uh, throughout a volume of space that's full of sunlight and full of carbon dioxide for them to breathe. And if they don't find sunlight, sunlight, they will die, they will end, and branches will fall off. But in the end, what you're left with is hundreds of years of history kind of crystallized or fossilized into the record of the growth directions of the tree. So we can sort of imagine what sunlight must have looked like in the history of this tree by seeing where the branches grew, where they had to access sunlight. If you grow a tree directly beside a house, you basically get half a tree because it can't grow into the darkness or the shadow of the house. There's nothing driving it to grow there. 
On the left, we have the most simple living organism. It's a single cell slime mold. It's actually not a mold. It's not related to the fungus kingdom at all. But it's single cellular, and it explores the world for food. It eats on lots of dead things, and if you give it oatmeal, it likes that. On the right, we have a very similar structure. It's non-living, classically. Uh, it's a river delta. Of course, it's more of a superorganism because its channels feed smaller organisms, algae, plankton, uh, animals, and plants. And it respires huge amounts of oxygen into the atmosphere through those photosynthesizing green plants that are there. So it, really it is a superorganism in, in that it's a collection of classical organisms. But even something as simple as the slime mold, or as complex as a river delta, the slime mold is capable of very interesting things. So if you kind of randomly put oatmeal flakes out on a plate, okay, and then you project light where the water would be, I, I, I should mention, this is a map of uh, Tokyo and the surrounding area. And each dot represents a city. And if the slime mold grows from a kind of analogous layout of oatmeal flakes, where you start with Tokyo, it will grow out and find every one of the oatmeal flakes, and it will connect them in a network that performs as well as the best engineered rail systems in Japan, the best engineered rail systems in the world. So a simple slime mold is capable of bewildering calculation. And it just constantly is confounding that in our world, irregardless of scale, on the left we have neurons, on the right we have superclusters, galaxies spread out on the largest scales in the universe, thousands or millions of light years apart. And these filaments that connect them take shapes. And those shapes we see inside our own brains, in the neural connectivity of our minds, and we see them on the largest scales of the universe. And irregardless of the material, of the physical forces involved, be they gravity or electromagnetism, or chemical gradients or pressure gradients, diffusion, irregardless of the kind of specifics of the problem, solutions to how to connect things end up looking remarkably similar if you squint. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. I thought you melt crayons for your research. <laughs> so uh, let's move on to some, uh, some fun fluid dynamics. Okay, so here we have um, two planes of plates, of plates of glass, and you put some liquid between them, and then you pull them apart. And the fluid naturally builds some very interesting structures, branch structures, which are, you know, one of my favorites. And what we're seeing here is in the pulling apart of plates, there's a vacuum pressure and air is allowed to infiltrate the thick uh, glycerin. This is like a soap. Uh, and displace it. And because the air is so much less viscous, it's so much faster moving than the glycerin, it tunnels through it in branch channels. And this process is called viscous fingering. If you inject, <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> the name predates any innuendo because in the fifties they just didn't think that way. So viscous fingering, as it's known in the literature. <laughs> The injection of one fluid into another. <laughs> There's no easy way to talk about this. <laughs> oh, and uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Time is running out. So if you do it, uh, you know, you inject air into liquid silicone. You create some kind of branch structure, which is great because then we can use it for biomimicry. Biomimicry is taking the shapes of natural systems, and what we have there is a caribou handler. I brought a moose handler, sorry, sorry that I couldn't be more specific, but the, these things grow at a rate of two inches a day in the heat of summer. Every year it drops off. I found it on the ice. And what does it do? It's, it's 
it actually serves mul multiple purposes. One, mating. Two, you draw the attention to yourself. Uh, two, uh, you know, uh, uh, battling. It's a, it's a weapon of kind. But one of the most interesting things it does is dissipate heat. You pump blood into your growing velvety antlers during the hot summer from your hot internal organs into the air where it cools off and you're able to pull your blood that way. How much time would you say I have? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to end it there and I, I know I, I didn't get to crowns but we'll talk about that next time. Well, you can ask it during the questions over. Perfect.